Thank you. Thank you very much. I must say, this is a, a humbling experience, no matter how often you do this, and it's so great to be a part of this, and thanks to, to Kenny and, and Nina, and to all of you, because you are, we are, the, the answer to, our, to, to the world's, the global future here in, um, today. So thank you very much for being here, and thank you much for that very warm welcome. Um, I'm, the name of my talk is called 12 Degrees of Freedom, and let me give you a little um, reason or an idea why I chose that, that title, with a little bit of background. Uh, Kenny mentioned earlier, I think uh, yesterday, talked about what the progress that's being made in Cleveland, Ohio. Cleveland, uh, as you probably know, was a place that, uh, home of Lake Erie and the Cuyahoga River. Uh, Lake Erie was eutrophied uh, the years before its time. It was made un uninhabitable for most living species. The Cuyahoga River, as Kenny pointed out, uh, was made infamous by the fact that it would occasionally uh, erupt in flames. And that's no joke. So 1969 is when that sort of came to light. Um, but it happened quite frequently before that. I remember oftentimes waiting for a school bus, seeing little black specks fall out of the sky, asking an adult what was going on, and they would just answer, the, the river must be on fire again. So Cleveland was the brunt of many jokes. Um, the year that I left to come out east to go to school in, in, uh, at Tufts University uh, in Medford, Massachusetts, the headlines of the Cleveland Plain Dealer read, Cleveland's air declared illegal. I didn't know if that was a joke or if there was what was behind that, but actually it was when the, right after the Environmental Protection Agency had sort of established air quality standards, Cleveland's air certainly exceeded the, uh, the threshold in terms of, of safety issues, and the officials, town officials, city officials in Cleveland said, we've got to clean up our act, and they sort of knew who the culprits were. Cleveland home to lots of industrial activity, basically rubber associated with the automobile industries. So they went to the factories and said, we, you've really got to clean up your act, help Cleveland uh, deal with this, this issue, but they didn't give them any specific guidelines. They didn't tell them they had to improve their, their, uh, uh, their manufacturing processes. They didn't have to install scrubbers or the new technologies. They just said, deal with the problem whichever way you can. So most of them took the easy way out. And probably, you know what, probably many of you know what they did. They took and raised their smokestacks a little higher. And they threw the pollutants a little higher into the atmosphere so the prevailing winds could carry them away. Turns out they carried them eastward to where I was going to land up in, uh, in, at Tufts University. So the Cleveland's problems actually followed me as I left home and went off to school. What it did, though, more than anything else, okay, what that did was make me aware that we really do literally live in an interconnected world. It's not just a metaphor, it's for real. And how do we deal with that? Well, I will say that traditional education really didn't prepare me to answer that question. And so the person who did was a guy by the name of Buckminster Fuller, whom I hope some of you or many of you know. And, and, and Bucky realized, I think it was a, a, many, a couple of decades ago, a few decades ago, Norman Cousins, the editor of the Saturday Review said, I just had this encounter with this guy, Buckminster Fuller, who told me he's just discovered nature's coordinates. And he said, I think, and I actually think that he did. And what, what Fuller did was to realize that nature works in a different way than what we were taught, or at least what most of us engineers were taught in terms of our XYZ linear coordinate system that is reductionist, that um, um, goes out into infinity. And he says nature works in a very different way and works with it omnidirectionally and gives us an opportunity to understand all the options that are available to us when we reach a certain decision point. And every time we reach a decision point, if we understand nature's coordinate system, said Bucky, we always have 12 options, 12 degrees of freedom to deal with a particular problem. So therefore, the, the title of my, my talk. Now, this is the old system that most of us were probably introduced to. It's linear, uh, cause and effect, externalities don't factor in because they can go out to infinity, uh, and the unintended consequences are usually unpredicted, but they're usually pretty bad. The con conventional consequences of that linear type of thinking are depicted here. We can see, again, of mountaintop removal, the consequences of Katrina and other types of, 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 of climato climatological catastrophes, um, agribusiness, um, and polluting energy sources. Uh, whole systems wisdom is very different. It's closed. Uh, there are learning systems, learning feedback loops. Synergy is one of the emergent properties, and synergy is a concept that's really prevalent in the whole concept of whole systems. Synergy says that you can't predict the whole by looking at the parts in isolation. It's operative throughout the universe. And as a way of an example, again, there's nothing in the individual properties of hydrogen 
the gas or oxygen, a gas that gives us any clue that when combined together in the right proportions, two part hydrogen to one part oxygen, that water will emerge. You don't see the properties of water in, uh, in, the, in the individual properties of hydrogen or oxygen, but it's a very important concept because it, it, it basically says we have to know where we're going before we can come up with the types of strategies that are gonna get us there. It talks about interconnectedness, complementarities, and the concept of cradle to cradle. There is no infinity. There is no somewhere else out there that we can dispose of our waste because it really is a closed system. And these are the types of solutions that we derive when we look at problems and, and solutions from a whole systems perspective. First frame here shows a, uh, not only wind turbines, but electric vehicles, plug-in hybrid electrics. The uh, upper right-hand corner there, are sort of from the Netherlands, really state-of-the-art flood control systems, not, not the types of flood control systems we see in New Orleans or in Louisiana, but systems that really work. And says if you're gonna have people living in these particular environments, then we really do need to come up with flood control systems that work. Um, agricultural systems that are local and small scale, and obviously clean energy technologies. Um, the trim tab factor is probably another important concept. When you look at systems, a whole systems perspective, you understand that there are critical points of leverage. And if you can provide precise amounts of energy at those particular leverage points, you can create huge effects, huge positive effects. Bucky used the concept of an ocean-going ship. You're going through the, uh, cutting through the water, you're going at a particular speed. It takes a great deal of energy to change the course of the ship. Ship speed has developed a great deal of momentum. The, the, the water is dense, and so to turn the ship requires a great deal of energy unless you know where to put what he called a trim tab. The trim tab, the trailing edge of the rudder, right above the surface of the water. And so when you, a little bit of energy turns the trim tab because it's not, it has, doesn't have to encounter the resistance of the water. As you turn the trim tab, it creates a partial vacuum. It turns the rudder and the rudder turns the ship. Every system has a place to apply a trim tab, not just physical systems, but social systems as well. And that's really what I want to talk about in terms of um, three examples in three different sectors this, this morning. Uh, the place where this really became sort of clear to me in terms of putting all these pieces together was at the New Alchemy Institute in Cape Cod. New Alchemy was founded by John Todd, Nancy Todd, and Bill McClarney back in the 1970s. <laughs> and what they sought were environmentally sound solutions to food, energy, and shelter. They understood that these are critical areas that needed to be addressed, and they also felt that we could apply nature's design strategies to meet those needs and do it in ways that would not undermine the ecological integrity of the, of the, of the planet. The, what you see here is a system that was uh, installed inside what's called the Cape Cod Arc, and it's an example of sort of maybe biomimicry on, on a system scale. The uh, tanks there were, are filled with water, and it's, for, it's a source of heat storage for the, a greenhouse. Water is a great source of thermal storage. But rather than just sitting there and being dead weight and doing nothing but storing energy, uh, they also were uh, the environment for raising fish, in this case, tilapia. So you've got heat storage in tanks, uh, also a place where they raise fish as a source of food, a good source of protein. Those tanks would become highly polluted in a very short period of time because the fish would deposit their waste. On the top there, you see the trays around, um, uh, running uh, along the side there. Trays were filled with vermiculite, just a substrate so that you could put plants in. Uh, lettuce, tomatoes, cucumber plants, they were supported by the vermiculite, but not in soil. The wastewater from the tanks was circulated through the root systems of the plants. The plants took up the wastewater, no, nope, sorry, no longer wastewater, nutrient-rich water. <laughs> Pollution in most cases are valuable resources in the wrong place. And what, what we all sort of got to understand is that, again, symbiotic relationships are there to be made um, in almost all the systems that we create, and that's what they discovered at New Alchemy. So the plants then take up the fish nutrients from the, from the water, and the water recirculates back through the tanks, and it's been purified. So you get your, your crops, you get clean water, you get your fish, you get your heat storage. And that was sort of the, almost the, the epitome of, of what we were trying to do. So how do we apply that to in, in real world, in real time, looking at, at areas of food, energy and shelter. Um, start with food. Uh, farm food policy advantages corporate agribusiness to the disadvantage of most small farms. When we're told that small farms are not viable, that's not true. They're not viable working within the existing system. On average, food travels about 1,500 miles. Thank you. 
on average food travels about 1,500 miles from farm to plate. That adds fuel costs and also uh, requires a great amount of pesticides and herbicides and preservatives to make, help them endure that, that trip. Uh, in Massachusetts, let's bring it down to the local level, between World War II and 1976, the number of farms in our state, my state, plummeted from 35,000 to 6,000, farmland acres from 2 million to 700,000, and we were losing about 20,000 acres of farmland and 200 farms per year. And at the same time, food prices in Massachusetts were among the highest in the country. We're looking for solutions to that problem, and we're looking for solutions that we could apply without perhaps the need for federal government and federal funds. And farmers markets emerge as one of the trim tabs in helping to change the system and help us meet our, our, our agricultural needs in Massachusetts. Um, Farms, farmers markets are incredibly important systems. They provide direct relationship between farmers and consumers. They're transparent in that everyone knows what, what's going on because again, you have that direct connection. Everyone is usually a little better off because of the existence of farmers markets, but probably nobody makes a killing, but it's a win-win situation. Uh, and it really is a more responsive system because consumers can talk directly to farmers and tell them what their needs or their wants are and farmers can respond knowing that they're talking directly to, to consumers. Uh, it also encourages diversification of crops because we convert farmers from wholesalers, where they, where they, where they, the only option they had before farmers markets, into retailers. And so diversity becomes a really important part of their marketing strategy and that's also a much more ecologically sound approach. But farmers markets back in 1979, when we started them in Massachusetts, were not accepted the way they, seem, they, they, they are today. Uh, you would think that it's a great idea, that type of relationship, that type of system would be welcomed by everyone, but we had a tough time getting them started in Massachusetts. You see this headline, wrong place for farmers market. That was in one of our local papers where we tried to establish a farmers market in, in the town of, of, of Brookline, but it, it met with heavy opposition. Folks, and the, the opposition was primarily a result of people not knowing what the markets were. Suspicion, fear, out of, out of ignorance because these were, were, were brand new. But they thought that they were out of character with the, with the area, that they would undercut investments that were made and, and designed to improve the area because these farmers were coming in with their trucks and they would, you know, whatever, some, have, somehow affect property values because of their, their trucks. Um, <laughs> and, and they felt that year-round merchants would be disadvantaged as a result of having farmers who they say were subsidized by, these, by the state to come in and sell their produce um, out of the backs of their trucks. So it met with heavy resistance. We, um, or, I think it was Dune earlier, uh, made a disclaimer about not being able to see um, Russia from his home in Alaska. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna, by full disclosure, I'm gonna tell you that at heart, I am a community organizer. And, and throughout this, throughout here, what you're going to see is that organizing really is sort of one of the, the important strategy that we use to really implement these trim tabs and affect the type of change that we wanted using small amounts of, of resources and, and energy. So what we did is we met with groups and reassured them that the farmers markets were not going to realize the fears or create the fear or, or make the fears that folks had a, a reality. And we would do that by making certain guarantees. And we guaranteed that the businesses would not be hurt by the market. And we gave the communities full control. We said if the markets really do in any way, um, uh, uh, in any way have an adverse effect on your businesses, we will close them immediately. And we did that primarily because we knew they would not, but we also did it because we felt that if they did, they should be closed. And so giving, you know, giving the community this, this, this assurance that we were doing these projects and these markets for the right reasons, I think was, was critically important and we earned local support. And as a result, the markets were open. They opened to rave reviews. They market spread throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And as you can probably see, they've also now become sort of commonplace throughout the country as a way of helping farmers really supplement their, their incomes. And I think it's really saved a, a number of farmers from, from going out of business. So we had a systemic change. <laughs> so
So it's an example of really sort of, of really creating a, a change in the system by finding, again, that critical point of leverage and finding the right tool or strategy for uh, making it, it, it happen. Uh, it also applies to community building. Um, again, the uh, community building and local, and I'm really focusing here on urban neighborhoods um, is a process that where we buy, we organize residents, um, we develop leaders, we develop tools for planning to give communities, uh, residents and communities the same tools in many cases that professional planning offices in cities or towns have uh, with the goal of creating safe and healthy neighborhoods. Um, the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative is one of the poorest neighborhoods in the city of Boston. It's multicultural, Latino, African American, Cape Verdean, and white. Um, in the 1970s and 80s, uh, the city had a program, a plan for urban renewal for the city of Boston. Many speculators bought land and bought buildings and sat on them in the ex expectation that they were going to make huge profits when the city's urban renewal, pro urban renewal program would, went into effect. Residents stood up and halted the urban renewal program. For many people of color, and this is back in the 70s, for them, urban renewal was Negro removal. And they said, you know, you're going to come in with programs and projects that are really going to force us out of our neighborhood, and they put a halt to it. And as those projects came to a, to a halt, the speculators said, we're going to be out of a bundle here. We're going to lose a lot of money. And what they did was they torched the buildings. And night after night after night in Roxbury, buildings burned to the ground, people were killed, but this was an attempt to collect insurance to minimize their losses in the face of the fact that they were not going to see their, 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 their big winning, their big kill come through. So the Dudley Street neighborhood was reduced to ashes, about 1,300 vacant lots right in the heart of, of Boston. Um, the Dudley Street neighborhood initiative was, reform, was formed in response to that challenge. In 1984, you can see the headline on the left, and basically the place as the, as, as the um, community was reduced to ashes, vacant lots weren't cared for, they became the place where they came dumping grounds. Folks on their way to the, the town dumps where they had to pay a tipping fee would drive by during the day, see all these ab abandoned vacant lots, and decide to come back later that night, knowing that no one was around, and they began to dump, and they began to dump, and they began to dump, and the place really became a health hazard uh, in, in short order. Um, the resident-led Dudley Street Neighbor Initiative developed a comprehensive plan to rebuild their own neighborhood. And it was an important step, they, and it was done primarily through community organizing, going door to door, organizing folks, creating a resident-led organization that really, would, that really would come up with their own plan for rebuilding their neighborhood. And the idea was to give residents control over their own future. The key, the key was, was uh, the, a, a move to establish the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative as something called a 121, 121A corporation. And this enabled it to have the, gave it the power of eminent domain over all vacant, abandoned land. Now, at that stage, there had been, never had been a community-based organization that had been given that power. And as a matter of fact, there were many people at DSNI who didn't want to accept that power. They felt it was the kind of tool that was used to really disrupt and, and, and destroy neighborhoods and that they weren't quite sure that they were uh, capable of using that in a positive way. But they, they thought about it. They, they created a board of their directors that was also a, a resident-led, and they decided that they would move forward and implement their comprehensive plan using this important tool of, of eminent domain. They got a $5 million loan from the Ford Foundation um, that was, would enable them to actually pay fair market value for the, for, the, for the parcels, which never had to be used because they were very savvy in terms of how they parceled the land and, and created their, their developments. And as a result, you've got new homes, you've got parks, town commons. The, the bottom picture there shows an old a garage that was abandoned, leaking oil. It was cleaned up and now it's turned into a community greenhouse. So more than half of the 1,300 vacant lots have been redeveloped. <laughs> the, 
The, the land has been converted to a community land trust, so it's in the, it's in the control of the, of the community, and um, affordable housing has been developed, and there's not been, well, maybe just one, I think out of, and over the years, only one default on the mortgage, mortgages that were um, uh, extended as a result of the, 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 the redevelopment of the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative. So it's a major, major accomplishment, and, and a, a, a one other example of how communities can take control of their future. People often ask, well, why is this, has this not been replicated throughout the city or around the, the country? And my, my real answer to this is, honest answer, is that I think that when the city officials granted them the power of eminent domain, they fully anticipated that they would fail. And when they failed, then the city would be able to move back in with its plan for urban renewal uh, and say we gave them every opportunity to succeed, even gave them the power in the domain, and they blew it, but they didn't blow it. And as a result, um, we don't see this replicated, although the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative is still very much alive and well. And, and again, it is a shining example. Now, hopefully, with any luck, uh, President Obama will take a look at this as well as other examples. <laughs> particularly given his community organizing background. Um, <laughs> moving, moving on just to, to the, the final sort of area, the final sector, uh, and that's, that's uh, energy. Uh, Massachusetts, well, this is actually pretty reflective of a lot of the country, but it, let me again boil it down to our, a, a real case in Massachusetts. Uh, we are dependent almost entirely on imports in terms of meeting our energy needs. Our energy portfolio is a, highly dependent upon natural gas, makes us susceptible to uh, price spikes and, and, and availability of natural gas, uh, puts us in a very vulnerable position. We have some of the worst air quality anywhere in the, in, in the country as a result of not only being dependent upon oil uh, and, and coal, but uh, overly dependent upon natural gas. So natural gas is probably the best of the, uh, the least polluting of the uh, fossil fuel sources, but nonetheless becoming overly dependent uh, on it puts us in a, in a vulnerable situation. So you would think you would think that a project like Cape Wind, the first, the nation's first offshore uh, wind farm proposed, a uh, first proposed offshore wind farm would be welcomed by residents of Massachusetts and Cape Cod. 130 wind turbines was gonna pr uh, provide roughly 75% of, of Cape Cod's energy needs located just off the coast of Cape Cod uh, in a, at a place called Horseshoe Shoal uh, with a very reputable developer. Um, installed capacity of 454 megawatts, but it met with very stiff opposition. Remember that headline, wrong place for the farmer's market? Well, this was the wrong place for a wind farm. Uh, I, I think the most disappointing part of this whole project was not so much that we had sort of, again, uh, oceanfront property owners who were opposed to this for obvious reasons, but we had some of our uh, top and leading and progressive uh, political elected officials who were also are on record as opposing this and, and long before the, the project had, had its, um, its, its day in court. So um, fortunately, we elected Deval Patrick, uh, governor of Massachusetts, the first black governor in Massachusetts history. And as part of his platform, uh, Patrick strongly supported the Cape Wind project, but he also realized that this should be part of a more comprehensive energy package. And so he worked with our state legislature and came up with a, with a comprehensive community, green communities bill that really runs the gamut and really the, the, for the entire spectrum from energy efficiency and conservation through um, the deployment, the development and deployment of re renewable energy. And it is probably the most comprehensive um, energy package anywhere in the country. Um, it includes an ocean act which will, will allow for appropriately scaled renewable energy projects in our state waters, and that can be wave, tidal, or, or wind. A Clean Biofuels Act, that's probably, probably the most controversial piece of the legislation, but we think perhaps with our biotech industries and others, we might be able to find ways of doing some small-scale um, uh, types of biofuels production that uh, does not run into the same types of land use conflicts, certainly as, as, as ethanol. Uh, Commonwealth Solar, which is a rebate program to buy down solar for residents and um, businesses, 40 to 60 percent rebates to encourage really widespread adoption of that. Decoupling, a uh, little technical, but it makes a huge amount of sense. Utilities, profits are based on how much 
uh, electricity they sell. Um, this decouples their profits from the amount of electricity so that they, can, they sell, so it can be more in line with uh, them sort of performing energy efficiency and conservation and being rewarded for that as opposed to the quantity of electricity they sell. Quickly, they also... <laughs> Just want to finish up here with one last piece, the Offshore Wind Collaborative. Cape Wind is still going through its permitting process, but it turns out that there are others, about 20, 19, 20 or, uh, other states in the country, coastal states that are interested now in developing their offshore wind resources. And the resource is vast. There are about 900,000 megawatts of offshore wind capacity off the coast of the United States. And that's equal to the total installed capacity in the country right now. Not that all of it can be tapped, but, but it certainly is a significant amount. We came up with, that is, the, the state working with the Department of Energy and working with um, the um, uh, GE, one of the major manufacturers of wind turbines, actually developed a bottom-up strategy for developing this and uh, uh, called it a framework for offshore wind development in the United States. We had to do this because there was no leadership coming from the highest levels of government. There was no no leadership in the White House to talk about promoting offshore wind, even though it has really made significant gains in Europe. So we did it from the bottom up, and again, there are states, uh, New Jersey, Delaware, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and even the Great Lakes. Cleveland, our old friend Cleveland, Ohio, my hometown, is also now investigating the opportunities for, for offshore wind. So here's a close with a formula for energy security that I, I think is, um, is, is worth pondering. We take a look at the Texas, North Dakota onshore wind corridor that T. Boone Pickens has been promoting uh, very vigorously. Um, we look at the mid-Atlantic by offshore wind resource, which is the stretch of offshore um, between the Northeast and uh, the Carolinas. We look at combining that with electric plug-in hybrid electric vehicles and smartening up the grid so it's more going to be able to respond more quickly to the introduction of, and the, the variability of renewable energy resources. And what we come up with a, is a transformation of our transportation system. We can talk about plug-in hybrid electric vehicles really being powered by renewable energy sources in a big way. And it really does, in fact, make sense. That's how we're going to cut our dependency on foreign oil. The, I, it, the, 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 the Achilles heel of renewables, particularly wind and solar for the most part, has been that it does not address the issue of transportation. Well, now it can. And if we really sort of think about this very hard and talk, and, and there are, again, companies that you can, you know, run down the gamut from Renault to GM and others who really are under, and Honda, who understand the importance and the, um, the, the potential for, for plug-in hybrid electric vehicles and our potential for providing renewable energy uh, supply in a big way, we, we realize that we really do have many more options than we think. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.